we're going to talk about this paper by Sean Carroll. Sean Carroll's a wonderful writer. If you're not familiar with his books and his blog, I thoroughly recommend them. It's Sean's take on the, the multiverse idea, but it's beyond that. As you can see, it says beyond falsifiability. So the multiverse thing we've done before in 60 Symbols, Mike Merrifield's looked at that. I think my views on the multiverse probably align pretty close to Mike's. My personal opinion is that that the reality of things requires there to be some test that somebody could do. They're not quite as um, complimentary and as quite as supportive perhaps as Sean's views, but he makes a very good case. I recommend this. It's available in the archive, a very well written paper. But what I'm going to talk about today is not multiverse. It's actually this thing called falsifiability. Look at the state of that. What have you done to that paper? It's got a bit ripped off and like it's, it so looks all yellow and it's... <laughs> doesn't look yet. Oh, maybe it does. Um, so uh, I took it on a train with me to read it. I've read it a few times. Um, this, there was a phone number written down here, which I didn't want to broadcast across the internet. Hence, I ripped that bit off. Um, I've scribbled on it. I've scribbled on it quite a bit. Um, I, I like this paper. So I teach a fourth year module, which is called the, let me get the P's in the right order, the Politics, Perception and Philosophy of Physics. And actually, I tell the students who want to do it, if you don't like writing, do not do this module. But it's about exploring the types of ideas that um, Sean Carroll's covering in here. And particularly the idea of, in, in inverted commas, the scientific method, capital T, capital S, capital M. Toward a primary school, you know, what's the scientific method? Well, you set up an hypothesis and then you test that hypothesis, you gather evidence, and then you either confirm or you deny that hypothesis. Lord, I wish it were that simple. Science is so much messier than that. And this idea that, you know, you can get the killer result or the killer experiment and that completely wipes out the field and we've got a paradigm shift, etc. Science really is about a great deal more messiness and uncertainty. And uncertainty is actually built into the fabric of experimental science. One thing we spend a great deal of time with uh, undergraduate students, certainly in Nottingham, but every single undergraduate course, per students in first year are driven to distraction in terms of considering experimental uncertainties and experimental error bars. It has to be weighed in a balance that can measure microscopic quantities. This idea that we get these incredibly precise measurements, sometimes, yes, we get you know, a precision, but the precision has always got a, an uncertainty associated with it. Everything in the laboratory is frequently tested for radioactivity. What's interesting here in terms of what Sean, Sean Carroll is doing is teasing apart this idea of falsifiability because it's held up as sort of almost a tenet of faith. What, what does falsifiability mean? I guess I need to get to that first. The idea of falsifiability was introduced by Karl Popper. So Popper was not at all happy with this idea of having an hypothesis that you test because he made the argument that it's very, very difficult to verify a theory that way. So he came at it from the other tack. He came at it from the opposite direction and he said, well, really what we should be doing here is we set up a theory and the first thing we should ask ourselves is let's be good scientists, let's be hypercritical, how would we disprove this theory? How would we knock this, blow this theory out of the water? And that's the idea of falsifiability, that if something isn't falsifiable in the proper sense, therefore it's not scientific. So here's a glimpse inside the mystery building where many hundreds of scientists live and work. This idea that you have that killer definitive experiment that, that Popper would say, well, that falsifies your theory, so that's definitely blown. It doesn't happen. It does not happen like that. I would say that actually we very, very rarely, if ever, set up an experiment whereby we have an hypothesis and we want to test that hypothesis. Often we're exploring. The vast majority of the time we're exploring. We might have some idea, we might have a grant application, we might be going in a given direction. We might set up our you know, Gantt chart and our ideas at the start in terms of how we're going to map out a timeline. Three months in, we've gone off in another direction generally. And that's because science is messy. How does such a discovery start? Well, uh, a really good example. I hate to use it but because it's, it's now almost a cliche, but it's a very important example, graphene. That was, what happened with graphene? How was that discovered? All that incredibly wonderful 2D physics, all the incredible links to, to particle physics, etc. Basically, afternoon, Friday afternoon, possibly a rainy afternoon to, like this, sellotape, scotch tape, I think they call it in the US, pulling off sheets of gra graphite um, to get down to that single, single atomic layer. But for them to then look further and say, let's get out the microscope or whatever and see what we've done, 
There must have been like a loose hypothesis. There but must what have been, would I they... reckon there's something on this tape. Let's go and have a look. Yes, that's exactly. A, that's a hypothesis, and then they went and tested it. Yeah, and, and there was something there. The, yeah, there's an hypothesis in the sense of let's go and have a look at this, but not let's go and look at this and see whether we can disprove whether there's something on this. That's that's not how it goes. Or let's go and have a look at this. And um, we're looking for that key falsifiability criterion. So you're not scotching the scientific method. You're scotching I, Popper's falsifiability. I am scotch. Uh, I am scotching. Is that what you said? Scotching. It's yeah. a good word. Scotching the scientific method. Capital T, capital S, capital M. I would say that depending on which lab you're in, depending on which community you're in, the way you do science is very different from another community. So I would not approach, as a physicist, I would not approach an experiment the same way as a biologist would or as a social scientist would. Even if we did approach experiments like that, even if we did have this falsifiability criterion, the question is, is you go, well, we falsify this experiment. How do you know? How do you know that if somebody on the other side of the world repeats the experiment in the way you did, that they will get the same result? You don't actually know. In that sense, science proves nothing. Science is fundamentally uncertain. You can have mathematics and you can have a deduction and you know you can have deductive proofs stem, proof stemming from those mathematics. The way we work in science, you know, we have a series of samples. We measure, 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 measure. We get a bigger sample size if we're sort of working on a more social level. And we assume that those, you know, the statistics of this experiment are going to be general. When in fact, we don't really know. We don't know if we measure 100 samples at the 101th sample. We don't have a, d a deductive proof to say that the 101 sample is going to be the same. Similarly, this idea that, you know, you can have the killer evidence. I can sit four scientists around this table. I can give them I, it's exactly the same piece of evidence, the, exactly the same experimental data, an image of molecules or whatever. If it's in nanoscience, some data related to, you know, some new particle, etc. whatever. And I can almost guarantee that there will be different interpretations. So how do we choose which are the right interpretations? I mean, Phil, I don't think it's breaking news that, that in almost any industry, the ideal and the tenets of that industry, whether it's accounting or filmmaking or whatever someone does, has this kind of platonic ideal and the reality of it is a bit messy. And why should science be any different? Is it, is it still not, as a general theme, scientists are having ideas and gathering evidence to test their ideas? Or are you saying that's just, that's not even at the core of it? No, I would say that scientists are certainly, you know, they're having ideas, they're exploring, they're, they're certainly gathering evidence to try to support one theory or another. And what I would say is, compared to those other industries, and that's a very good, obviously there are different working methods and the stuff that, you know, happens behind closed doors. The problem is science, and quite rightly, science is held up to a greater level of scrutiny in terms of the evidence base and the scrutiny and the, the degree of criticism and cynicism. And so the problem is, the sort of fallout from that is that um, science has become this, I like the way you said platonic, so it's sort of almost this um, ideal, this utopia, whereby, you know, this is the, this is the way you do science. You know, and this is how you know you're taught in school. This is the way you set out your hypothesis. You do na 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 na. You come to the end, you verify or your your your, your theory, and it's so much messier than that. And so there's the, the the issue with sort of getting the killer data really comes down to how does a particular theory survive? Certainly, some of that, some of it is due to the strength of the evidence and strength of the data. But you can have very strong evidence and very strong data, and if the prevailing sort of um, opinion within a community is in the other direction, you're going to have to fight really hard, particularly if you're a small group, if you've got a world-leading group or a number of world-leading groups going, this is the paradigm that works, and you're a small group or you're a PhD student and you're trying to get it through, you're going to have a hard time. So this is what Carol is getting at here. I, I love this. The way in which we judge scientific theories is inescapably reflective, messy and human. That's the reality of how science is actually done. It's a matter of judgment, not of drawing bright lines between truth and falsity or science and non-science. That's so important because there is this idea that, you know, well, science is so incredibly objective. And at some level, once you get, you know, evidence piling upon evidence, you sort of reach the point where it's almost an inescapable c conclusion. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, you can go very far along one direction where there's something called cultural relativism, who would, proponents of that would, would argue that actually everything is societally biased, that, that every particular measurement is, is related to the culture in which it's made. I'm not going that far. 
but I am thoroughly agreeing with Carol here and also this arrived for me today, a friend bought me this, um, Social Physics by Alex Pentland. There's a great, I've already read quite a bit of it over lunch. Um, as we've seen so far in this book, new data are changing this argument and we are now, this is really important, we are now coming to realise that human behaviour is determined as much by social context as by rational thinking or individual desi desires. Rationality, as the term is used by economists, means that we know what we want and act to get it. But my research, Pentland's research, shows that both people's desires and their decisions about how to act are often and perhaps typically dominated by social network effects. Do you know what it sounds like you're doing to me? Is you're kind of stoking the fires of people like climate change deniers or flat earth people or all these people who say scientists are pulling the wool over our eyes. You're basically saying, well, yeah. Scientists normally say, no, no, look at the evidence. We've got this robust system, so you should trust our results. And you're now saying, it sounds to me like you're saying you can't trust us. Right. I will, I'll put the question, the same question to you as I put to the fourth years um, when I, t I teach this module. So are you, uh, would you consider yourself a climate change denier? No, I wouldn't. No. Okay, so you'd, you'd consider that there's sufficient evidence out there to support the idea of climate change? I sort of trust the scientists have There done you it. go, hmm. there you go. And I, when I asked the class, the fourth year class, that's exactly, I'm certainly not suggesting for one second that I'm denying the evidence behind climate change. For me, in terms of what I've looked at, there's very, very strong evidence for climate change. But for somebody who isn't a scientist or for somebody who's outside the field, I haven't done the simulations. I haven't analysed the data. At some level, I am taking it on trust and faith that there's a consensus here and therefore I'm going with that. And now you're telling me don't trust the consensus because... No, I'm not saying that. I'm you are. You're saying sometimes if a scientist comes up with a paradigm-changing result, if they're a small group without clout, they can't change the prevailing belief. I, I didn't quite say can't. I said we'll find it very difficult, and they will. But in the, the important thing is despite my scepticism about the scientific method, capital T, capital S, capital M, it still works. You know, it still works. You know, if I do an experiment here, drop this, and, and measure the acceleration due to gravity. Somebody in Japan does the same measurement, give or take an experimental error bar and taking into account, you know, different positions of the We get the same result. That's remarkable. That's, that's really remarkable. But like anything, almost like anything in life, it's not this black or white. It's a spectrum and it's shades of grey. And so you've got to build in that as well as the, those objective results and that reproducibility that we get, in terms of more speculative theories, like the multiverse, for example, a big element of it is, is how convincing your argument can be. What journals are you publishing? What type of coverage are you getting? Are you in BBC, you CNN, etc., etc.? All those type of things. All those type of social activities play in. Are you saying that the scientific method shouldn't be taught to young people at school? I'm saying, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying in terms of collecting evidence, thinking about experimental design, thinking about how you're going to analyse your data, all of those. I would suggest it needs to be broadened out a little bit to say that instead of there being a definitive scientific method, there's a spectrum of, of how people do science and get them to think about it. you know for one thing when I go into primary schools for example one thing I say about being a scientist is a great thing great part of my job is what do I spend when I can get into the lab what do I spend my time doing playing and an awful lot of scientists they mightn't admit it but that's what they're doing they're playing so when we're manipulating atoms moving them around that's great fun. Of course there's you know key scientific elements of that and of course you get insights into how matter is behaving but it's great fun as well. So the social element is based right into the fabric of just how we do science and the idea that you can disconnect the sort of human aspect of us from the science, that's what you've been doing for years Brady, showing that you know you, scientists are human as well. So what's the Phil Moriarty scientific method? Every, you say every scientist has a different method. What's yours? Poke and prod until you find something. <laughs> that's, 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 that would be my method. Basically you're saying you wouldn't want to see how we make the sausage. No, no, I'm saying precisely the opposite. I would say come in the lab, see how we make the sausage. Science is all about honesty. Science is, as, as Feynman said, I hate to quote Feynman because, you know, everybody quotes Feynman, but there's a reason everybody quotes Feynman. Science is about bending over backwards to prove yourself wrong. So, you know, you should be open, you should be honest, you should get people in the, in the lab. And one of the, the issues as we get more and more sort of commercially focused is that, you know, proprietary issues become and people want to hide the data, not really share it because they're competition with the lab. That's a real shame. It's a winner that will earn dollars for Britain and the grateful thanks of patient and doctor everywhere. Bring people in the lab, 
you get in the lab. You've been in the lab, Brady. You know how messy it is. You said Feynman said that it's about bending over backwards to prove yourself wrong. But you told me just a couple of minutes ago that you don't do that, that you don't you don't have a an, an finding and then spend the next six months trying to falsify it. Is it about, are scientists bending over backwards to prove themselves wrong? Or I would say in, in, in the context Feynman means that maybe he meant Popper, but I think he's me meaning what I was saying in terms of, you know, if, where's the noise? Have we, you, your first reaction should be we've screwed things up and then work back from there and try and, and find out only when you've eliminated this, 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 this and this, do you then start to think, well, possibly maybe we've got something here. I think that's the sense Feynman meant. Ah, uh, well, uh, ask any schoolboy, it's beyond me. Uh, we, we, I say that because if there were only a finite number of possibilities, quantum mechanically, then in an infinitely old universe, all of those possibilities would happen over and over again an infinite number of times. And this relates back to another important question in cosmology, you know, the arrow of time. Why is the past different from the future?